That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. And the Oracle bowled in. That is out. Great theatre, magnificent drama. First match of the season, eh, huh? First match of the season, Martin. King Willow's on his throne and all's right with the world. Gods and flannelled fools. Um, <laughs> it's from a poem about cricket. Oh, very apt. How does it go on, my old hound? That's the only line I know. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. You certainly made the point. Hello, and welcome to Gods and Flannelled Fools, episode 10. Seven tests and eight ball overs. This is the series in which I walk through a history of English Test Match cricket, focusing on key series, matches, players and teams of particular interest. And basically, I explore the myths and legends of the game that collectively have led to how we view Test Match cricket today. Now, if you haven't already listened, my pilot episode, which is a a brief history of the game up to the very first two Test Matches in 1877, Uh, is available, as well as the first nine episodes over the course of which, uh, well, I've covered so much. Um, There's early legends of the English game, such as uh, Sidney Barnes, Jack Hobbs and Wally Hammond. Uh, We've got classic series included, such as the 1902 Ashes and the Bodyline series. I talk about uh, concepts such as timeless tests uh, and some of the more famous post-war series. So worth checking all of those out on my channel. There's a Twitter profile for the series, at GFFpod, and I'll also make some notes in support of this on the blog, which is available at godsandflannelledfools.blogspot.com. So perhaps the starting point for this episode would be to look at the the progression of the English team from the point at which we left them uh, up to 1970. Of course, the 60s was not a particularly happy or successful decade for English cricket. Um, but as the, the decade near an end, neared an end, uh, things began to improve. Uh, now, whilst a number of iconic and established players, uh, players such as Fred Truman and Ken Barrington, retired, um, a, a steady mix of talented and disciplined players began to emerge. And that really helped to forge a more balanced side with more bases covered than had been the case under the captaincy of Ted Dexter. Uh, Dexter, of course, had been replaced as captain initially by Mike Smith and then subsequently Colin Cowdery over the, the course of the decade. Now, including, uh, included in this list of, of up-and-coming talent, um, you have the batsman John Edrich. Um, you can include Colin Cowdery himself, of course. He was established by then. Um, and also Basil Dolavira. Whilst um, in the bowlers, there were the, uh, the quick bowlers of uh, Peter Lever, John Snow, and uh, Bob Willis, as well as the slow, medium, deadly Derek Underwood. Um, Alan Knott also came into the team in this period, and he's still regarded to this day as being one of English, uh, England's finest wicketkeepers. Perhaps the most famous name to have emerged since the West Indies series that I previously covered, however... Um, was the young Yorkshire opener, Jeff Boycott. Now, Jeff Boycott was born into a miners' family in West Yorkshire in 1940, and he began playing cricket at a very early age, winning a Len Hutton batting award and progressing to Hemsworth Grammar School. Um, and it was there that he became captain of the first 11 at the age of 15. At this point, he struggled with his sight and was prescribed glasses Um, something that he took very badly given the impact on on his game. Um, But he persevered and he left school at 17 determined to become a professional sportsman, having gone on trial for Leeds United as well as um, taking up a trial with Yorkshire County Cricket Club. After a couple of seasons playing second 11 cricket, he began his professional career with Yorkshire in 1962 and would go on to play over 400 matches for the famous Uh, a famous county, amassing over 30,000 runs with 100 centuries and an average of nearly 58. In fact, he would go on to average over 100 in a domestic season on two occasions, 
And that's a feat that has only been achieved by Mark Ramprakash in uh, English cricketing history. Now, Yorkshire had a very powerful side throughout the 60s with Fred Truman, Brian Close and Ray Illingworth, all strong personalities in the dressing room. And Boycott often clashed with these, these guys. Uh, initially, he was, um, uh, he, well, his role in the side was, was regarded as a relatively attacking batsman. But soon he became known for his attributes of stamina, determination and concentration. And these uh, attributes we can hear in the clip from the ex-umpire and one-time teammate of Boycott's, Dickie Bird. But I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, of all the great players I've seen, if I had to pick a batsman to bat for my life, I'd go for Boycott to bat for my life. He never had the natural ability or the natural flair of a Vivian Richards, a Greg Chappell, a Barry Richards, a Sunil Gavaska, Graham Pollock, people like this Greg Chappell. He never had their natural ability and natural flair. He was probably the best self-made player there's ever been in the history of the game, self-made. I started my career at Barnsley Cricket Club and I went with a chap called Michael Parkinson. You've heard of him, haven't you? <laughs> And we were both kids together at Barnsley Cricket Club. And we had this young schoolboy who batted at number six for us called Geoffrey Boycott, number six. And I remember one night we finished practicing and Jeff were only, he was only 14. And we were sat on the boundary edge, Parkinson, myself and Boycott. And we were just talking, we running kids. And Boycott said to Mike Parkinson and myself, he said, by the time I am 23, I shall have the full white rose of Yorkshire on my cap and I shall have the three lions of England on my chest. And by God, he did it. I've never met anyone like him for application, dedication, concentration, and believing in himself, and also mentally strong. You can have all the ability in the world, whatever walk of life you're in, whatever job you're in, if you're not mentally strong there and believe in yourself, you'll fall by the wayside. And this was boycott strength. He was very, very strong there. There have been times in test matches when I've been umpire and he's been batting and he's been there, you know. And I've had to say to myself many a time, you know, I've, I've, come on, get a grip of yourself, come on, Dickie, get a grip. Don't let him put you to sleep, come on, Dolly. <laughs> A boycott made his England debut in 1964 against Australia at home and he registered his maiden test century in that same series at the Oval. He then toured South Africa and after a couple of minor dips in form during the mid-period of the 60s, he became an established member of the side, cementing a place as a solid, gritty, dependable opener. And this reputation as a slow scorer took effect in the 1967 series against India in which he hit 246 not out on his home ground of Headingley, only to be dropped for slow scoring, a decision he's never accepted to this day, as listeners to uh, Test Match Special, as I am, will no doubt be aware of. He would finish his England career, a career that would take him through to uh, the early 80s, with over 8,000 runs in 108 tests with 22 centuries, and his average of 47.72 is the highest completed career average by an England player since 1970. The boycott's teammate, Ray Illingworth, had been a successful leader for Yorkshire, but he'd left for Leicestershire in 1968 at the age of 36, and he was really a, a surprise replacement as England captain for Colin Cowdery in 1968, and um, to, to even more surprise, let's say, he led the side to a run of 27 matches without defeat in the period up to 1971. And this sequence began when they drew with Australia at Lords in the second test of the 1968 Ashes series and ended in 1971 when India won the third test at the Oval by four wickets. And they played 13 tests with only one defeat immediately beforehand and so played a total of 40 consecutive tests with only one defeat, dating from their innings victory over the West Indies at the Oval in 1966. And during this uh, remarkable period, they beat New Zealand, India, the West Indies and Pakistan. And under his leadership, they would travel to Australia in 1970 with their best chance of regaining the ashes earned since the 1950s. 
I had the good fortune to captain my first full series uh, for Australia against Ray Illingworth of England. Ray Illingworth was, was a very good captain. He was a tough Yorkshireman. Uh, Yorkshiremen are noted for not giving much away. They don't buy drinks at the bar. They don't give you any uh, free runs out on the field. And, and Illy was, was a very good captain. Um, the first thing you noticed uh, when you played against Ray Illingworth was he was interested in having a real game of cricket. He was trying to win the game from the first ball, unlike some captains who, who try to get into a position where they can't lose and then try to win the game. Ray was trying to win the game from the first ball. The most important lesson that I learnt from, from Ray Illingworth was um, uh, how to captain the side in what I think is the most difficult circumstances. When the opposition is starting to get on top and you know that you've got to save some runs but you don't want to totally um, hand over control to the batting side. And Ray Illingworth was very good when at that point where he knew he had to pull back, he would pull back a little bit but he would always let you know as a batsman that he was still trying to get you out and that was a really important lesson that, uh, that I learnt from uh, Ray Illingworth. Um, the, the other thing that I remember about Illy was, uh, despite the fact that he was uh, perceived as a Dow Yorkshireman, he had quite a decent sense of humour. I didn't actually appreciate it at the time, but uh, the first ball that I faced in the 1972 series, um, we'd just lost a wicket after England had dropped three pretty easy catches in, in, uh, just before I went in. I went in, played the best hook shot I've ever played in my life off Tony Gregg's first ball and got brilliantly caught at fine leg by Mike Smith, standing with his heels on the rope and reaching up, he caught it at full stretch. We are playing at Old Trafford, so I had to walk off sort of past cover, cover point area. Having run to the other end, I had to walk right past the cover fieldsman, who happened to be Ray Illingworth. And um, as I walked past Ray, he just looked at me and said, oh, bloody good shot for naught, son. Which, uh, as I say, at the time uh, wasn't all that comforting, but uh, it's nice to know you're playing in a series against a guy who's got a good sense of humour and uh, who also was a very good captain. Thoughts there from the former Australian captain Ian Chappell on Ray Illingworth. Now, before I get into the detail of the 1970-71 to 71 Ashes series, there are two points of interest worth noting. The first of these is the number of balls bowled per over. Now, in the pilot episode of this series, in which I walked through a brief history of the game leading up to the very first test matches, I touched upon the evolution of the number of deliveries prescribed in an over. And this is uh, indeed something that will be a surprise to many to learn that it didn't remain static from the outset. Um, although there was a general convergence between the leading countries, the number actually changed from as being as low as four uh, up to eight in different periods from the late 1800s through to the Second World War. And actually, if we, if we look at the game in England specifically, this evolved as follows. So 1880 to 1888, there were four, uh, four balls per over. 1889 to 1899, there were five. 1900 to 1938, there were six. 1939 to 45, there were eight. And 1946 to the present day, there have been six. So essentially, following the continuation of cricket after the end of World War II, we had six ball overs in England, and, and that's what we, what we have right now. But for the other sides, such as South Africa, New Zealand and Australia, so Southern Hemisphere sides particularly, this number continued to evolve right through to 1980 when standardisation fell upon six balls and over in every form of cricket at every level globally. In the case of Australia, uh, when England arrived there in 1970 to contest the Ashes, they would be partaking in eight ball overs, uh, which they had been for, for the previous few decades and something that would continue through to the end of the 1970s. Now, for a non-cricket playing listener, two balls might not seem a significant deviation away from, from six balls, and yet it would potentially have a significant impact on both bowler and batsman, not least in terms of the, uh, the consideration of time taken to deliver the over, uh, particularly in the case of a fast bowler, um, and the concentration um, prolonged over a, more, uh, uh, over a greater length of time for a batsman to play out a maiden during a you know, difficult or hostile spell. And there's also the psychology of the process with the way that a bowler 
might try to set up a particular batsman with different deliveries and uh, a captain with field placing. And with an extra two balls, this would change and it would represent a, a, challenge, a, a challenge to cricketers, um, particularly those used to just one format and having to change to the other for, for the duration of a tour. And it's actually worth noting on this point with the forthcoming 100 competition in England, the prospect of five and ten ball overs is perhaps not as revolutionary as we think, although, of course, those nice maiden and wicket symbols in score books across the country might suffer. So the second uh, observation is that the 1970-71 Ashes series was unique in so much that it was the first series to have more than five tests scheduled. And in fact, six test matches were scheduled for the series, although seven ended up being registered in the Wisden records. And if we look back to the birth of the Ashes concept in the 19th century, with one exception, uh, the first ten series uh, consisted of two or three tests and then they moved to a standardised format of five, which was more or less the case through to the end of the 60s. Now they introduced the extra test in the 70 to 71 series. And at the same time, uh, we had the very first limited overs international, which I will, I will go on to mention. Um, and although it was felt that the quality of the cricket suffered a little in this particular series, partly due to the stressful nature of the scheduling, the experiment with a greater number of tests did continue over the next couple of decades. Um, of the next 14 Ashes series, half would have six test matches instead of five, and the last one uh, being the 1997 Home Ashes series in England. And with three formats and more sides competing than ever, one finds it difficult to imagine six tests coming back any time soon. Though, of course, you know, I do remember several of them growing up back in the 80s and 90s. So this 70-71 uh, Ashes series was, was a pivotal series in many ways. As well as the, the number of tests and introduction of limited over cricket, the very first match at Perth would be played. And there would be a, a changing of the guard on both sides. Now for Australia, it would be the, the last ever series for their captain, Bill Laurie, and the famous trio of Rod Marsh, Greg Chappell and Dennis Lilly would all make their debuts. That is very good. The swing works, the Oracle again. Heading into the first test at Brisbane on the 27th of November 1970, England had struggled for batting form in the tour matches, but they did manage to cancel out Australia's first inning score, the 433, with their own 464. And despite an Australian collapse in the second innings, there wasn't enough time for England to make the 183 in the final session, though the draw was interpreted as a moral victory to kickstart the series. And of course, those who are familiar with recent Ashes series will know the value of avoiding defeat at the, uh, at the Gabba. The second test took place at Perth, which was the inaugural test match at the WACA. Uh, Bill Laurie put England in, which was a surprising decision, and Boycott and Luckhurst put on a century stand, England finishing with 397. And once again, the time elapsed for a result to be forced, despite England declaring on 287 in their second innings. However, England's quick bowlers had started to find some form, which would serve them in good stead later in the series. And Peter Lever made his debut for England and led a strong pace attack alongside John, Slow, uh, John Snow, and Ken Shuttleworth with Bob Willis waiting in the wings. And the third test at Melbourne, scheduled over the new year, was abandoned due to rain without a single ball being bowled as a huge deluge over the new year um, prevented any play from occurring during the first three days. Now, many observers felt spared um, uh, from the, the kind of the, the dull cricket that had, uh, that had persisted through the series to this point. But it did allow the players some rest from the intensity of test cricket in what was uh, considered to be quite a gruelling series. And to compensate for this, the officials decided to abandon the match after three days and instead play a one-off, one-day international consisting of 40 overs per side and sticking to the eight ball over a format. And this took place on what would have been the final day of the original uh, scheduled test. England batted first and were all out for 190 off 39.4 overs with uh, 
John Edrich making the, the very first one day international half century and the, the, uh, the highest score of the game hitting 82 runs. When Australia ended up winning by five wickets, however, with 42 balls remaining, Ian Chappell scoring 60 and his brother Greg finishing unbeaten on 22. And that was 93 years after uh, having won the, the very first test match on the same ground. It was a historic occasion and led the way for this new format to enter into the international calendar. Ultimately, it led to the first World Cup later in the decade. And the two teams settled back into the longer format and the fourth test at Sydney started on the 9th of January 1971. And fortunately for both, the sake of the, um, the final result and the spectacle, the wicket was less flat and the ground staff... Um, had been asked to do something different by Bill Laurie this time, keen to uh, avoid a repeat of the, uh, the, the first two tests. Now, Illingworth won the toss and elected to bat first and was repaid by an unlikely attacking innings of great fluency by, uh, by Jeff Boycott, who would continue his fine form throughout the series, averaging at 96 over all first-class matches. Now, he was caught at fine leg, hooking unusually on 77, and a good start was pegged back, with England finishing on 332, their lowest total so far. And in response, John Snow launched a hostile assault on the Australian batsman. And despite an impressive 55 by Doug Walters, they were dismissed for 236, deadly Derek Underwood doing some damage with four for 66. It's worth noting, I would say, the contribution to the English side by, uh, by Derek Underwood during this period and though his best performances tended to be on damp green wickets in England, he was of huge value to a succession of English captains, often referred to as an umbrella as you took him around in the squad in case of rain. Now here's some thoughts from Boycott and his old teammate. Good shot. Fine. He accepted that. But he didn't like them pinching singles, especially if the fielders were a little bit asleep or a bit slow in stopping it. On wet pitches, Deadly, it was his name, Derek Underwood, was unplayable. Really was. Remember a match against Kent, and it was raining. We sat in the pavilion, and we said joking to him, Deadly, what do you think? This rain, six for 40, you'll get? He said, yeah, but if it rains another hour, I'll get seven for 20. England had time in the second innings to build a big lead, and they took... Uh, they took that time with Boycott taking seven hours to make 142 and Illingworth eventually declaring at 319 for five on the afternoon of day four, setting Australia 416 runs to win, which at the time no team had ever managed in history. Now they finished at 60 for four at Stumps on day four and were then all out for 116 the following day, with Mackenzie retiring hurt, having been struck in the face by another vicious John Snow delivery. England winning by 299 runs and going 1-0 up in the series. And the fifth test started at uh, Melbourne on the 21st of January 1971. And this test was introduced midway through the series to make up for the lost third test and replace the touring match in order to squeeze into the already packed schedule. And this was another dour draw, despite Australia reaching 493 in their first innings with Ian Chappell making an impressive 100. Neither captain wanted to take a risk, and in the end, England finished on 161 for no wicket, chasing 271, that really had been essentially set as an artificial, arbitrary target, as only four hours of batting remained in the match when Australia declared in their second innings. So at that point, Australia, uh, sorry, England were still 1-0 up. And then the, the sixth test began at Adelaide only three days later, making it a back-to-back -back turnaround. And as with the previous test, it was another boring affair, with the only difference being that England batted first, and it was left to Australia to chase an arbitrary total with no time left on the final day. However, the one element that England lacked at Adelaide was the threat posed from their quick bowlers, as both Lever and Snow were suffering from injuries and were unable to bowl um, either as many overs or as quickly as they had done before. Uh, both sides were relieved to experience a short break before what would be the, effectively the seventh test, um, beginning at Sydney on the 12th of February 1971. 
And the big news beforehand was that Australia dropped Bill Laurie as captain with only one, less, uh, with only one test left in the series. And being 1-0 down, the selectors felt it was time to, to move. Um, and the aggressive Ian Chappell was, was made captain instead and would go on to be a highly successful uh, captain for, for the, uh, the national team. And this was actually the first time Australia had replaced a captain mid-series. And again, thinking in, in recent times, you know, one thing that Australia are uh, very often is, uh, is loyal to their captains. For England, they were forced to rest Jeff Boycott, who had injured his wrist in a tour match against the fast bowler McKenzie. And he later maintained that the injury would permanently affect his wrist and that he carried a squash ball in a sock in his pocket, which he would squeeze to keep his wrist strong. And Ian Chappell won the toss and chose to bowl first on a slow, damp wicket. And this decision seemingly paid off, with England being dismissed for 184 on the first day. In response, Australia finished at 13 for two and then resumed the next day, hoping to establish a significant first innings lead. Now, at this point, John Snow launched another hostile spell on the batsman, this time receiving several warnings from the umpire Lou Rowan for intimidatory bowling. And it all came to a head when the tail ender Terry Jenner ducked into a short ball and had to retire hurt. And when warned by the umpire, Illingworth replied, by stating that Snow had only bowled one genuine bouncer. And following this argument, large sections of the Australian crowd began to boo the English players. And when John Snow returned to his fielding position, unfortunately that was at, at long leg, right on the boundary, he was pelted by bottles and cans and pies. And when he reached the actual boundary perimeter, he was grabbed by one spectator and had to be wrestled free by some others. And it's worth noting um, that in those days, the, the boundary reached most of the way to the, the actual fence and the, um, uh, and the advertising hoardings. And that's kind of completely unlike um, the, the modern day sort of current setup where you have a sort of plastic covered uh, ring well inside the actual circumference of the, of the grassed oval. So, and, and you can see that if you, if you go online and, and search on YouTube for clips from the 60s and 70s and... Um, probably right the way to the early 80s, you'll, you'll see how uh, players right on the outfield would be right at that, uh, that, that extent. So at this point, uh, Ray Illingworth led his players off the field and back into the, the dressing room uh, without conferring to the umpires. Um, and it was really done to avoid injuries to, to his players. And the England manager, uh, David Clark, tried to push Illingworth back onto the field and, and Lou Rowan... The umpire told them if they didn't immediately return, they would forfeit the match. Uh, and, of course, therefore the Ashes. Um, and they were both backed by Alan Barnes of the ABC network, who were broadcasting the match. But in response, Hillingworth refused to back down. He stated that they wouldn't go out there until the playing area had been cleared and the crowd settled down. And he also criticised his own manager for siding with the opposition. And in the end, his resilience won over. There was a seven-minute delay whilst the ground staff cleared the the, the, the ground and the playing area, um, uh, one, uh, uh, one particular uh, member of staff having to be taken to hospital um, because he had a can thrown at his head, something that probably um, made Illingworth's decision valid um, in the first place. And in this time, awkwardly, Greg Chappell and Dennis Lilly remained at the crease while all this took place. And when play resumed, Australia uh, subsequently finished uh, at 264 with an 80 run lead. Now, despite missing Jeff Boycott, England um, uh, managed to get 302 in their second innings, Luckhurst and Edrich making 50s, and setting Australia 223 to win uh, when they were finally bowled out on the fourth day. Uh, John Snow yorked eastward for a duck, but then disaster struck when he damaged his hand trying to take a catch on the boundary and ended up gruesomely having to have surgery on broken fingers and missing the rest of the match. However, Ray Illingworth was fired up by the events of the previous couple of days, and he stepped up and took three for 39, whilst uh, Derek Underwood and, and Dolivere as well both chipped in with a couple of, uh, of wickets each on a turning wicket. And Australia were bowled out for 160, losing by 62 runs, and giving England a 2-0 series victory, reclaiming the Ashes for the first time since 1956. 
I mean, pretty much every area of the game in that series, England had been the superior team. And despite the gruelling schedule and at times heated atmosphere, Ray Illingworth had led the team superbly well with, with Jeff Boycott's 657 runs and an average of 94 being the most since Wally Hammond in the 1928-29 series. Um, and John Snow's 31 wickets was the best haul since... Uh, Larwood in the 32-33 uh, to 33 Bodyline series. And moreover, Alan Knott had a record 24 dismissals and John Edrich spent over 33 hours at the crease, which remained a record until uh, Shivnarine Chandapur broke it in 2001 against India. And when Jon Snow later recalled his memories of the victory, he described scenes of beer and champagne, multiple hangovers and, most vividly, Basil D'Oliveira jabbing his forefinger into the chest of every Australian he met, saying, we stuffed you. The 1970-71 series was, in many ways, a, a transformational series. It was the, the first in which player behaviour genuinely declined across the board. Um, and with the advent of the limited overs format making its way into the test calendar... Uh, colour television broadcasting being more widespread, um, and fast bowling taking a more defined role in the weaponry of a side. Um, it's genuinely come to be seen as um, ushering in many of the changes in the game that would take place throughout the course of the 70s. And this will be uh, forming the basis for the, for the next episode in the series. So that, uh, that brings a close to, uh, to episode 10. Um, and this will be the final one of Gods and Flannel Fools uh, for this calendar year. Um, if you happen to listen to, to this uh, on release or just after it's released, I shall wish you a very happy Christmas. I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's listened to this series over the last 12 months. Please remember to share these videos, subscribe, uh, get other cricket, li uh, cricket lovers to subscribe and, and anyone uh, who might be interested and feedback your comments as much as possible. It's all appreciated. Until the next episode of Gods and Flannel Fools then, thank you and goodbye.